Yes. Norman and Ava have arrived. Norman and Ava. Hi, everyone. How are you? Hello. Uh, I'm Alex Witt, and just wanted to let you know uh, what a pleasure it is to speak with these two luminaries. But I'm also going to just inform you that at this time, we're not going to be able to have Q&A because we all want to hear what they have to say. We'll try and fit some in, perhaps, with the end of Nicholas Kristoff and Cheryl Wudun. We will see. No guarantees. But with that, we're going to get the conversation started. These two need no inter introduction. You guys are here because you know exactly who they are. So I want to get to Norman's career as a wonderful predecessor to that of Ava's and ask you, Norman, how it was in the wake of the tumultuous 1960s, how it was that you said, you know what, the best way to sort of address a lot of the issues in this country and, and try to develop a uniformity of family and that we're all the same and we all deal with the same issues, you used humor. Was that just a natural progression because of you and the way you look at things, or did you You're, think that would be the most effective? Your question assumes I knew what I was doing. Well, there's that. <laughs> and uh, what, I was, what I thought I was doing was struggling to make a living for a burgeoning family. I have six kids. I had two kids, uh, two of them around that time and another coming and, and so forth. I was facing a divorce. I was remarrying. All these things were going on. That was my life. The, uh, the reason I think we were doing what we did is uh, I'm a serious person. I think I understand the foolishness of the human condition. I understood it from the day my father was arrested and sent to prison and uh, my mother was selling the furniture and I'm nine years old and in that situation with some guy about to buy my father's treasured red leather chair, this guy puts his hand on my shoulder and says, well, Norman, you're the man of the house now. Mm. And I don't know if I knew the word asshole then, <laughs> but, but I thought he was a fool. Mm. And, uh, and I began to understand, you know, that wherever there was a human being in whatever situation, however sad, however difficult, there was the foolishness of that condition. Any resistance to the development of Good Times, Samford and Son, the Jeffersons? I mean, these were born out of the success of All in the Family, so at least you had that pedigree on which to rest your laurels and make the pitches. Well, you know, uh, Esther Roll was uh, Maud on Maud, which was a very successful show. She played Maud's maid. They had a great relationship. It was clear Esther Roll was a star, at least clear in my eyes. Uh, what we did in that, uh, to recognize that, to help the, uh, the network recognize that there was something more possible here, was to have her husband in an episode of Maud pick her up. We cast John Amos. Now they were looking at, a, the, net, the network that is, were looking at a couple, and uh, they went with it. And I'm talking too much, and I have Ava sitting here. Oh, no, I love these, sto these no, stories. No, no, she's next. Don't worry. <laughs> so there was an you evolution. We, we crossed possibly, our lives crossed possibly before she was born. What, what really? Year? 72. 72. No, it's a couple of years. She was three or four when I bought a property, uh, took an option on a property called A Wrinkle in Time. A great children's book. Amazing. Which Phil, this woman just concluded. Just yeah. finished. Phil, yeah. she concluded to the tune of over a hundred million dollars. They said, Yo, Ava, we think you can do this. Let's give you a little <laughs> bit of a budget here to work with. I, I was going to get to that, but since Norman has brought us there, what is a wrinkle in time? What have been the challenges with that? And literally taking a hundred million dollars. I mean, Ava, you have not been doing this all that long. You've met with outstanding success for the not even decade, if I'm right, right? That you've been a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you went to journalism a little bit, you did the public relations thing, and then you launch into this. I mean, talk about then to now. Well, I don't think of it in terms of challenges. Hello, everyone. Happy to be here with you. Don't think of it in terms of challenges. You know, I think of this, the, the beautiful synergy and the, the just really warm energy that I try to put into my work and, um, and what comes out of it. For example, Wrinkle in Time, the fact that, 
you know, Norman Lear was the first person to option that work and that um, it was really kind of championed for the first time to become anything other than the book through his company. You know, an artist and an executive and a visionary who I hold in such high esteem. Don't we all? Um, that it came back to me all these decades later. You know, that when you think about us being different gender, race, you know, 50 years between us, um, that there's still... Uh, a, all? Yeah, that's all. <laughs> This uh, kind of psychographic around, you know, a way of thinking that um, in which we can all be unified, where different kinds of people can think about art and kind of come out um, on a similar side. And so that's a lot of what I've tried to do, whether it was through my first pursuit of journalism, through um, about a decade where I owned a PR firm and I represented a lot of properties here in town or my transition into filmmaking. It's all about how can we use art as a centerpiece, as a trigger for conversation where we can find common ground. Which you've done beautifully. You have used the vehicle of drama, though. I mean, let's face it, Selma. Oh, because I'm not funny. <laughs> I'm not no, so you're, unfunny. Well, I'll be, no. I'll be your straight man. Yeah. <laughs> but, but is it because... Yeah. I mean, I, I referenced the tumultuous 1960s. They, they were pretty rough. But when you look at today, I mean, granted on MSNBC, I have the pleasure, displeasure, whatever, of reporting the news sometimes, and some of it is just heartbreaking. When you, it's, If it's Trayvon Martin or Philando Castile or Eric Garner or any number that will go along the pike, is it more difficult now? Do you think the conversation around civil discourse uh, about the inequity in society, racial, economic, all of it. Is it more profound now, or is it just that we're talking about it more and we're even more aware of it than we were then? What do you think that's led you to drama? Well, I wasn't around then, but I do know that it would be highly unlikely at that time for Norman and I to be on a stage together as equals. I mean, we're not as equals, but as... Um, <laughs> as uh, well, why are you buying into that shit? Well... <laughs> Well, because one day I will be, I will have 10,000 properties behind my name on IMDb, but not yet. <laughs> um, but in terms of, you know, artists who can have a conversation and have this kind of exchange, being who we are, finding that common ground in a public space like this, where it's elevated, where there's an audience there that looks like you all do, that wasn't an easy and likely thing 50 years ago. And so, um, so it's, it would be disingenuous of me to sit here and say, well, it's the same as it was back then. It's not, you know, I listen to stories of my mother, my grandmother, where there was, you know, um, a certain look if they even walked into a place like this. So I'm starting on a different playing ground. Now, yes, there are challenges, and that's something that we all need to work towards. But I do feel like um, there's been progress. When I did Selma and I, you know, studied uh, the civil rights movement, when I worked on 13th and I went back even further and tried to connect the dots of, like, where does oppression come from in this com country and how has it progressed? I, I can say for sure that there's been progression, not hardly enough, mm. um, and not, not as deeply rooted as it should be, but it's happening. And you have, I would assume, some both racial and gender discrimination. Do you find that still to be super prevalent in Hollywood, Hollywood despite the fact that a couple years ago we had all the Oscars so white hype, and I know there was some level of being upset as a result of Selma that it, w it was criminal in my book that you were not nominated for a, a directorial Academy Award. Do you think that that had something to do with it? Uh, no, a lot of other people did. I, I wasn't, I was, I was not surprised, surprised as some others were. I didn't expect anything to happen. I've been a publicist in this town for a while, and um, I know how that all works, and I know where my focus is on making the work. So uh, it was unfortunate at that time, a lot of that um, anger or people's frustration around it uh, was twisted to feel like it was coming from me. But um, I wasn't surprised by it. And I think that you know a lot of marginalized people have, um, both in business and in art and politics and all kinds of ways, to find a way to assert your voice um, you know, outside of the mainstream paradigm. That's why. You know, it was so um, striking at the times when, you know, Norman's uh, work that really centered black life mm -hmm. were on television, um, in people's homes every day. You're talking about, a, you know, a woman who, you know, having to introduce the network to the idea that this woman who was a domestic worker had a husband, mm -hmm. and that they had a family unit. And right now we look back and we're like, oh, it was good times. But it was radical, radical work, radical justice work that was being done and made us laugh. So, Ava puts this very simply, the fact that you introduced this to the nation, that there was, a, there was a woman and she had a husband. I mean, just put things in such simple terms. What are we missing still today, Norman, 
that doesn't allow everybody to just look at everybody else as just like them. What, I, what is I it? Don't, I don't think we're really having the conversation we should be having. We're, we're not really talking about race and really talking about, or we'd be talking about kids across the country in urban areas in certain locations everywhere uh, who don't have an equal break simply because uh, they are black or Latino, you know, uh, and otherwise uh, deprived. And the country isn't doing it. And there is no re real conversation about how are we going to handle this? We want these kids to grow up to be, we, we talk about growing up to be citizens, voting citizens. Uh, when I was a kid, I'm reminded, uh, we had civic classes. Mm -hmm. When I, I mentioned my dad going away and I was nine years old, it was a, a time when I learned from a father Coglin on radio that there were people who hated Jews simply because they were Jewish. And, uh, <coughs> and that, at nine, with my dad away, I needed all the help I could get. But I had a civics class. And I knew that that was, a, that was not the American way, mm -hmm. that everybody was under the law my equal, and I was under the law everybody else's equal. And, uh, you know, I, that, that, I, I don't believe anything stronger than that. That's the promise of this nation. And we're not making good on it. Not, we are making good in some ways, and, but at the base of it all, we're not even talking about it rationally. Mm -hmm. And yet, one thing I remember so profoundly was November of 2008, <coughs> when we had the first African-American man ascend to the presidency of the United States. And I remember watching election night and, and him being in Grant Park there in Chicago and tears streaming down my cheeks as, as, long, as long with many, many others. So there was an expectation and yet the Obama legacy, where do both of you think that stands? And if it's not where you think it should be, why not? What, what hindered it getting there? You first. You. <laughs> <laughs> Big questions. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it seems to me that we're in a period where the Obama legacy is being dumped on. Uh, and I think there are all kinds of reasons for that that would take an afternoon. Uh, but I do think the time will come when, uh, when the country and the establishment will look back on uh, Obama as having really accomplished a great deal. Uh, how, how black do you think Obama was? Uh, 100%. 100%? Yes. Here's what I wondered. In the first debate with, what's his face? Which Who's one? the Republican? In his Mc first debate with McCain? Romney. No, no, Rom with, with Romney for the presidency. There was a moment where, uh, this I'm, I'm about to say is very personal and you'll know where it comes from in a moment, where uh, the man to become president, where Obama was like this and Romney was in his ear. Mm. And it was clear the man, and I thought, was giving it to the bully. Mm. And it made me wonder, as a result of my own life and background, uh, was there a nine-year-old black kid in Obama that he lost for that moment? I mean, that he was there mm -hmm. f for that moment. Mm -hmm. And was that a strain, and a, you know, not strain this way, but a strain in his life? Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> That's not, that doesn't require an answer, I don't Yeah, know. yeah, no, it, it's things to think about. I mean, I think it, that gets into a deconstruction of what blackness is um, when we ask how, how black he is. Um, but I think in general, in terms of his, his legacy, I think uh, a part of the, the reason why people might, I mean, as any president, you dissect the legacy and you want to try to discern what happened, what stuck, what didn't, how it changed the culture, how it changed the world. Um, but in general, I think there was an, un uh, uh, an unrealistic, very pedestrian expectation mm. 
of what that was going to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I hear people talk about what it could have been and what it was, um, as it is re as it relates to race, which is really what people are saying when they ask the question, um, it is uh, you know it points to um, a real juvenile notion of the fact that one person, one black person, could be held up in this way, and that there would be a shift in the kind of systemic, you know, and Norman knows the systemic kind of the way in which the systems of oppression work in this country was going to at all be remedied, remedied by one man in one great mm -hmm. position. It was, it was an impossibility, mm -hmm. and there were amazing things that were done. And I, I feel like amazing is an overused word, and I don't use it often, but I'm amazed that when you really look at what was done over the time with the kind of vitriol and opposition that was in the way, um, there was a lot, um, a lot accomplished, and mm -hmm. there was something in the culture that, um, that shifted. Um, now we're on the other side of that, and we can look at the things that shifted in a positive way, and things that shifted more to an extreme, which are, is are, why we're in the situation we're in now. Sir. Are we looking at and talking about what you called, described as vicious, and what was the other? Uh, I don't think we're talking about what he had to fight in the two words that you just used to describe it. Mm -hmm. That's an ongoing conversation we should be having. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Is it though, is it economic, Ava, in your mind? Is that really the genesis or the root of everything that maintains um, the racial disparity in this country? I mean, it, I've always thought education is at the crux of it, but without the monies put into certain communities to get the good education, to attract the teachers, to get the right environment, I mean, the buildings, the books, just the basics for kids, that you can't rise above? Uh, so the question is, is it economics or is it education? I think the core word, well, when, I the think, when I think about it, is, is privilege. You know, there's privilege that goes across um, every aspect of the life of a marginalized person, a person of color in this country, that people who do not have, who are not of color, don't have to deal with. And it affects education, it affects housing, it affects, you know, economics, it affects... It affects, you know, how I feel when I walk in a store. The hmm. privilege of being looked at twice, or no one looks at all, and, and you do your thing. Um, it is, uh, it is, you know, this. Whether it's a new Jim Crow, or whether it's um, Matthew Desmond's Evicted, or just a bunch of books and scholarship that really talk about privilege as a center point, as a thing that we need to de deconstruct um, and really examine for ourselves intimately about the ways that we benefit from privilege and how we trade in it and how we, um, how in order to protect our own privilege, we um, literally have to step over someone else. And, and we all have that, even me as a black woman filmmaker sitting here, which is from a very small tribe, there are like five of us. <laughs> um, I still have privilege in the society over uh, uh, a gay black woman filmmaker. Mm -hmm. um, I still have privilege over a uh, a black woman filmmaker with disabilities. You know what I mean? We all have um, uh, a place at this table, and some are in a higher chair than others. And I think uh, part of it is not just saying economics or education, it's thinking about us. That's what we try to do with the 13th. It's not like yeah. pointing a finger at, every, at any one thing, it's saying you have to think about your place in it. And um, for me, privilege is a key word there for discussion. So how do we, how do we rise above? I mean, it, it's discussions. I look at things. I'm a, I'm a mother of two kids. My son's here in the audience, and I'm proud that he's here and listening to all this. And I'd, I'd love to think that I've generated conversations around the dinner table that allow them to examine themselves and the society around them. Is that what it is? Does it start at home? Do you think that's the nucleus? Even, But not everybody even has the home environment necessarily affordable to them. How do we get above this? Norman, how do we get above well, race in America? And how much does Holly... In, in two no, but, minutes. But how much... Norman, no, in two minutes, you've got... A, you know, it's eight seconds. minutes, actually. But how much, how much does Hollywood have a responsibility to at least get the conversation going, even if you've only got them for two hours in a theater or 30 minutes in front of a television? In the last minute and a half, there are 19 questions. Okay, go. I'm sorry. That's the way I think. It's like, uh, <laughs> What's Hollywood? You know, I've, I, I've wondered through the years, does uh, television lead, as you read now and again, television is leading the culture. Television. Then, uh, it, or is television mirroring? Does it just mirror what's happening, or does it 
also mirror and lead because these people who didn't know about this are now learning about this, and I guess it's both. Uh, it mirrors and it leads in that it's introducing people who didn't know about XYZ to XYZ. When you talk about kids, as the father of twin daughters who are about to graduate from college mm -hmm. this semester, uh, and have been to, you know, I, I've only had them to talk to on the phone for, for four years <laughs> and a little bit of visiting. And uh, I don't think I had any fucking influence on them at all. <laughs> they are so much their own people. Pick, they're picking up what they picked up from their homes, from their lives, but, uh, but totally individual. And, and uh, I recognize my older children more, maybe because they've been parents for so many years, as the people I knew when they were kids. I don't know if any of that is clear. Mm. If it isn't, I have a big car, please follow me. <laughs> Any sure. thoughts to add to that? Uh, okay, how about this? Your responsibility as a filmmaker, um, a woman, a woman of color in Hollywood, you have your outlet array, array now, and that is offering opportunity. How much does that mean to you? I mean, what do you hope comes from that? How big do you want that to get, aside from huge? <laughs> You know, my dream for Array is for it. So Array is a film uh, distribution and advocacy collective that focuses on films by women and people of color. So often a woman will make a film um, and not be, if she's able to kind of have that kind of the tantamount achievement of making a film and all that goes into doing that, we find that there's uh, another brick wall that folks come up against with distribution and sharing the film. And so it's a very grassroots effort, um, really kind of humbly rendered uh, with volunteers around the country and small donations. Um, but uh, we distribute films by hand. One of our new filmmakers is here, Sarah Lohman. We just acquired her film, um, a beautiful film that'll be coming out in the fall. But I think um, I don't want it to be big in the sense of, uh, of huge. I just as a black woman in business want it to be here another year. I want mm. consistency. I am fine with longevity. Mm. It doesn't have to be massive. For me, massive is for me to be able to talk about Array in 20 years, not as something that I did, but something that's still living and growing. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, a, a big thing that I've had to interrogate for myself is scale. You know, mm. like when, like I want it to be huge. I want all of this. I think, you know, for me, I'm just interested in the long game. I just want it to be around. I look at Redford and what he's done with Sundance Institute. I look at um, the folks at Tribeca uh, and what they've built. And, and I look at Norman Lear, <laughs> the great Norman Lear. And what he has. <laughs> I look at some of these, you know, these, these, these creative institutions. So, you know, with institution building, I mean, it's, it's a question. I mean, do you try to scale up and be huge or do you just try to hang on? What do you think I should do? No, I, I love what you said about you wanted to be able to talk about what you were doing at any age. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, I have a new show on the air now, uh, a Latina version of One Day at a Time. It. On Netflix. On, on Netflix, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> and, uh, and I think about that too. I love being able to say what I, talk about what I'm doing, yes. not, not what the past That's right. did for me, but what I'm doing today. Yeah. Yeah. And Great. what that's doing for me. Um, Ava, A Wrinkle in Time, that's just wrapped with filming and, and it's out next year, is it? Yeah, March of next year. Uh -huh. And what have been the biggest challenge of that? Is it just... Are going to come to the premiere, Norm? I'm sorry? Are you going to come to the premiere? There's I'm, I'm going to be invited to a yes. screening. <laughs> yeah, I was screening before the premiere. Before the oh. premiere. Well, that too. Oh, <laughs> yes, I'm at the premiere. Yes, yes. Oh my God, am I at the Red carpet the moment here. Um, but you do, excuse me, I just wondered how many people know the book because it was such you a know, huge Time, book. Madeline Engel, it, yeah, yeah, it's remarkable. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's just a glory it's that is so being made. So amazing, know, yeah, it really is cool. So what, what is, uh, Oprah is in it. Oprah is in it, it's yeah. Terrific. Oprah, can I, can I yeah. mention what Oprah said about you? I mean, it's, it's yes. something that is, <laughs> I mean, I, I can't imagine how proud you must be, but Oprah, 
says, Ava has become a dear, dear friend of mine. I feel about Ava the way Maya Angelou fell about me. I see her rise and I'm like, oh, I'm so proud. I love to be a part of that. Mm. And may I Look at that smile. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that has to be wonderful for you. No, it's fantastic. I mean, that there's no greater compliment really. No, not at and all. No. I didn't think I'd have a reason to t say it, but Maya Angelou, is the godmother of the twins I just talked about. Oh, wow. See, this is all full circle. This was destined. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. Wow. Um, did you know that? No, I did not know yeah. that. Wow. I asked Ava about Array. You have two institutions that, uh, if you're a student, you can be at USC and you can be a part of the uh, Norman Lear Center of the USC Annenberg School for Communications and Journalism, my alma mater, uh, People for the American Way. Those are two things that, that you put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into and get this going. And they have, certainly People for American mm -hmm. Way has endured that which we hope happens with Array and you know th that kind of a destiny. Um, when you look at people and you say, all right, get, get off the couch, get off the chair, put your money where your mouth is and do something, what, what do they take from what you've done? They may not be able to create a television show. Well, no, what, what, I, <laughs> what occurs to me is not what they, what, what occurs to me is, I have yet to be arrested. <laughs> I want to get arrested for some good reason. <laughs> and whatever the hell I've done, I have not been arrested. We can work on that. Yeah. <laughs> we'll work no, on that. Be a partner when, I, I'm here. serious. That's, that's just the dynamic deal. I think that's coming. <laughs> Um, what happens after uh, we have the Netflix streaming? She rightly puts uh, it's Netflix and it's one day at a time. You're in season two of that. Yeah. What's the difference between what we all got to know with one day at a time? What's the difference making it uh, of a Latino family? Wherein lies the big difference? Just the cultural background? Well, they're Cuban-American and uh, they bring with them all the traditions of uh, family life in Cuba. So they're very... Uh, what interests them, what, what, what they're looking for uh, in America, the way they feel about America, it's all uh, original to me because I didn't, you know, wasn't raised as a Cuban-American. And uh, Rita Moreno at 85 is a wow. glory in this <laughs> piece. An actress by the name of Justina Machado is just, oh, she's, she's, really good. she's mm -hmm. fabulous. And uh, there, there, oh, there, 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 there might have been a strike, yeah, but there, how glad we the strike happen. didn't occur. Mm -hmm. So there are 11 people sitting around a table, not that far from here, working on number eight, the story for number eight. Yeah, I think that got resolved about, what, nine hours ago? I think it just went a little bit yeah. past the deadline, so we're glad for that. Um, well, unfortunately, the clock is telling me that I'm out of time. We have uh, nine seconds, though, for hearty applause for these two. How's that? <laughs> Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Ava and Norman, thank, thank you, you both so much.